Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, this talk is part of the Authors at Google series. Uh, we have a couple other talks going on this week. They're both actually tomorrow. Um, we have Gail Solit talking about communication and positive limit setting with young children. Um, and we have a conversation with Nolan Bushnell tomorrow. Uh, you can learn more about these at go slash at Google. Um, but today we have Patricia Curtin. Um, and we're proud to present her. Patricia is an artist, designer, and pr printmaker. She has a long association with Japanese Restaurant in Berkeley as a cook, a cookbook co-author, designer, and illustrator. She has designed and print printed letterpress and linoleum block special occasion menus for Japanese for several decades. The menus have been collected in her recently published book, Menus for Japanese, which will be on sale in the back for $15. Um, in addition to cookbooks and specialty printing, Patricia has designed images and typography for logo identity, wine labels, product packaging, calendars, note cards, book covers, and tattoos. Please join me in welcoming Patricia Curtin. Hello. Thank you for inviting me. It's really exciting to be at Google. Um, I came to talk to you about my book. and. Before I get into exactly showing you all these things, I want to tell you a little bit about my background and relationship to Chez Panisse, how this came about. Um, I actually started uh, working at Chez Panisse the first year it was opened in 1971, which is 40 years ago. The restaurant just celebrated its 40th anniversary. And at the time, I was uh, an intern at the print shop of poster artist David Lance Goines in Berkeley. And that's how I came to know the people, Alice, and the people at Chez Panisse, and ended up working there in the dining room. And so for a time, I worked in, um, in the daytime at the print shop and uh, in the evenings at the restaurant. And then I got very sort of swept up and very interested in all that was going on at the restaurant and the, f the incredible food and the energy there and what was going on. And I sort of started spending less time at the print shop and mornings then in the pastry kitchen and the other kitchens and eventually ended up spending most of my time in the kitchen and cooking, which was a great, wonderful adventure. And after a time, <clears throat> I ended up then starting a family and wanted to change that and so I stopped cooking and about that time, Alice started uh, getting contracts to doing cookbooks, and we worked on the first one. And then uh, I just sort of flipped over from cooking and went back to printing and design and uh, cookbooks, and, but still working with Chez Panisse and still working with Alice. And um, the, it's all still about the same thing, which is really about the beauty of food. And, but now I work mostly in... Um, two dimensions, and printing and designing and making images. So this, um, this book, um, <clears throat> here's the dining room at Chez Panisse, about 5.30 before dinner begins. It's a little small place, it's very intimate. And these menus that are collected here um, were made for primarily the downstairs dining room for special occasions, such as birthdays, I'm going to come back to these images, but birthdays, anniversaries, um, there's an annual Bastille Day dinner, um, there's New Year's Eve celebrations. And the book is organized chronologically. So the menus start actually in 1972, and alongside the menus are short texts that tell sort of different stories about maybe the event or the person it was made for or some visiting luminary or some other occasion. And uh, before we get into me really showing you those menus, I want to tell you a little bit about the process of how they're made. Um, they're letterpress menus. and. I have a beautiful old cast iron letterpress. It's called a Chandler and Price, C&P. And it is a 
it has a clamshell action that um, sort of opens and closes like this. And the paper is fed into the press by hand. It sits on um, the area called the platen. It's a flat area of metal, and that's the part that closes and meets with the block or the type or whatever's being printed. You can see the block there vertically. And it's a one color press, prints one um, color of ink at a time. That's the ink plate and the rollers are spreading the ink on the ink plate and the, the ink plate slowly turns with each cycle of the press and to distribute that ink evenly and then it comes down and it rolls over the surface of the block and the press closes and it prints and the paper comes out and a new paper comes in. And <clears throat> it was built, and this press is about 120 years old, still as solid as the day it was made. It was mainly built to print type, metal type, handset, and this is a sample of a little bit of typesetting. Um, and that's a process that is pretty much outdated now. Purists still do it, but it's, it's uh, putting the type together, letter by letter, space by space, space between the lines, very, very laborious and handmade. But um, recently, last 20 years or so, the advent of polymer plate technology has really regenerated and revitalized letterpress printing. And that is still the same principle of relief printing, printing from a raised surface like type. Um, but this material is uh, a thin layer of metal and on that is um, another layer of polymer material that has a photo ground coating on the top. And to, to make the plate digital typesetting or some other form of image that um, can be output as a negative um, the negative and the polymer plate are sandwiched together. It's exposed to light and where the light hits the photo ground on the polymer surface, it hardens. And then the polymer plate is washed in warm water. It's a great thing because there's no toxic photochemicals. It's a pretty benign process. And then the, um, the softer polymer material just rinses away and you're left with that relief surface. So it's, it's a very... Um, wonderful, easy technology that means you don't have to set type and put the type all back in the box. And um, So it, it, it then locks up in the press. It sits on a magnetic base, so that thin layer of metal on the back sits on a magnetic base, and then those two things together, the base and the, and the plate, equal a measurement that is type high, which is the universal height of type, metal type. And so that means anything you can make a plate out of, you can lock it up in the press and print from it. So a lot of small letterpress shops have come up um, because you don't have to have all the equipment and all the type and all of that. You just need a press and uh, access to a plate maker and it's, uh, it's done something pretty wonderful. But how I make images primarily is linoleum block. And similar to the polymer material, linoleum block is, is a thin layer of linoleum mounted on wood, and it's approximate type high. I usually have to build up the back of it. And linoleum is a natural material. This kind is called battleship linoleum. It's made out of powdered cork and linseed oil. It was developed by the military uh, just before World War II to, as flooring for their battleships and submarines, and which, you know, it's impervious to water and it's soft enough to stand on so your legs don't get tired and and it has a, a, a sort of a little porous surface it's not flat like metal or polymer and so when it's printed it has a sort of stippled texture that I find really beautiful and you can you can really identify linoleum from that look once you know what it is and the process of making them the prints, the, the blocks themselves, is I start with a drawing, and then pretty simple drawing like this, as you can see. And then you have to, I use a drafting paper, turn it over and trace it on the back, because when you're working in um, printing, you have to work in reverse. And then 
I put a sort of graphite crayon on the back and tape that onto the block and then trace the, through the drawing onto the block. And that leaves something that looks like a pencil line on the block. And I do that for one block for each color in the print because the press prints one color at a time. And so if the image has four colors, then there are four blocks. And then um, once that drawing has been transferred to the linoleum, then um, it's cut and carved. And that's a, that's a process of removing all the negative space in the print. Um, so as you can see with this leaf, the block on the bottom, you can see the, the lines of the gouges where the linoleum has been removed so that only that part that I want to print is there. Here's um, an example of this violet image. Uh, the image is made from four blocks. And the first one on the, um, on the left is the dark green leaves of the image. So that was printed first. And then the second block is uh, the area under the leaves, just a solid, and that's a lighter green. So that's coming through the lines that are cut in the first image, the veins and inside the stalks there. The, the third one is uh, another line image of the sort of outline and interior lines of the violets. And then the last one is the tint, the purple tint color of the violets. So those are printed one at a time. The, there's also a little bit of an orange that you'll see in the image that is the center of the flowers that I just added by watercolor. It's a little hard to cut those tiny little spaces and get them in the right place. So that's, that's the basic process. Here's, here's the finished menu that that was made for, a New Year's Eve uh, menu. So if, usually when I'm making these menus that have text, I'll print the image first, and the last thing that happens is the type is added at the end, a separate run. So as I say, these, the organization of the book is the menus are chronological, and the first ones that I made early on were really typographical. I didn't know how to do this linoleum work at that time. So I was setting these by hand, uh, metal type, and using little type ornaments and that sort of thing. And another, um, another aspect that's sort of fun about this book is reading what's actually on the menus. Um, there, it's kind of a snapshot of the history of Chez Panisse as well, um, and really what was being served when, and in this case, for how much. Uh, it's pretty, pretty astonishing. Uh, homemade pastries for 75 cents. Uh, Lindsay Shear, who was the pastry chef, the starting pastry chef at the restaurant, made fantastic, fantastic desserts. And you could just go in and get a wonderful little cappuccino and, or a cup of coffee and, uh, and a slice of her almond tart. For, you'd pay one dollar. It's pretty amazing. When the, when the restaurant first opened with their four-course meal, and they just, it became famous, I don't know if you know about Chez Panisse, but they became famous for serving one prefix dinner menu a night. So it was either four or sometimes on weekends it would be five courses. But when they first started, it was $4.50 for a four-course dinner in 1971. Of course, they were losing a lot of money. So. <laughs> Uh, after about six months, I think it went up to 650 or so, 625 or something like that. But now it's far from that. So I didn't really start making too many menus until after I stopped cooking. Um, I would I would dabble in it a little bit, and I did acquire a press during that time. But um, I didn't really have time. I was too busy in the kitchen. Uh, but then. Afterwards, when I started working on the books, and I wanted to print more, and I wanted to um, add images to the type. And so I decided I, maybe I would try to learn to do this linoleum work. So this is one of the first blocks I cut, a single color. And um, it's really it's pretty simple. But I, I was thrilled by it, and I thought, I, I, maybe I can do this. You know. And the other way that um, I was making menus at the time at the, was um, in collaboration with my husband, Stephen Thomas, who is a printmaker and um, prints etchings, an intaglio printer. And so we would collaborate and 
I would do a drawing on a copper plate that he would etch or something else and then combine it with type. And so these are etchings. Um, and when we were doing these, because that's a really um, time consuming process, printing etchings, it was usually just a small number for maybe that particular party, uh, one table of four or six or eight or something, um, very small number. This menu on the, uh, on the left, the menu for the Potato King, was for a friend of ours who uh, had an absolute obsession with potatoes, and he always wanted potatoes um, with every meal, which wasn't a meal, unless there was a, some, some kind of potato dish. So for his birthday, we made him a, a menu that had potatoes with every course, and uh, put together quickly just this little menu in a couple of days, and Stephen printed it. The other is, uh, was for a dinner uh, for James Beard, who didn't often come to the restaurant, but he came this one spring, and it was the time we were just harvesting uh, green garlic, the young garlic that you only get right in the spring. And at the time, that was really a new thing. Now you see it in all the farmer's markets, but that was kind of a big deal to have this young green garlic. So that, that's what decorated the menu. And Stephen and I did um, a number of New Year's menus together um, for a, uh, a few years in a row, and, and we, um, we like to focus on a celestial theme, and um, sort of the big picture, and took some inspiration from some photographs, uh, NASA photographs that were coming back of the Earth from space for this one. Here's another etching, it's a mezzotin actually, and um, this was uh, an astronomical occurrence of a blue moon uh, the, the second full moon within one calendar month, and it was that night of the New Year's Eve dinner, so we couldn't resist that. But then I, um, I, I, I started working on this linoleum thing and um, tried to get better at it, doing, getting a little more ambitious, and uh, the images start out very simple. These are sort of just shapes with a little line work in them. And often the imagery that I would do is, you know, I, I was working at the limitations of what I could manage, so they had to be simple. But um, sometimes they were inspired by literally something on the menu that was an ingredient or something um, being served. Or um, oftentimes it would uh, be something that represented the season or the time or the moment. Um, that's. That's, this one's kind of both. And here's another sample of a kind of menu I would do sometimes. And um, oftentimes, we, there was somebody special was coming in. There was two days notice that Elizabeth David or Richard Only or Julia Child or someone was coming and Alice really wanted a special menu. Uh, so in those cases, I would do something very fast, just set the, set the text in type and print that and then do hand decoration, a uh, little drawing and, um, in this case, a watercolor filling in for, for just that small group of people, that table of four, that table of six. This was um, a special lunch for Richard Olney, again, he's, he's no longer with us, but he uh, was very influential cookbook writer. Um, an American, an expat who lived in France for most of his life and wrote about French food um, and wrote for an American audience. Um, really, he wrote about the, uh, the cuisine de bonne femme, which is just the ordinary, wonderful household cooking of French, French homemakers. And, and, and he elevated that and really broke it down, really fantastic. Uh, Fantastic books. So here, this, this was an important breakthrough for me, this particular menu, because the imagery is really simple, um, but I drew it, I drew it from life. Uh, hadn't, hadn't been doing that. Um, and I got these leaves, and I wanted to somehow get this color. And so I drew the leaves and figured out this composition, and then um, I, I 
had this kind of light bulb go off that, well, maybe on my press that has this ink plate that turns around and spreads the ink, maybe I could disconnect that. I disconnected the device that turned the ink plate and then mixed different colors and just spread them, spread them on the ink plate by hand and then just let the rollers blend them a little bit so that if you picture this menu turned on its side so that the block is 90 degrees, you can see stripes of color red, yellow, orange, and then more yellow. And, and so with one pass through the press, all these different colors on the ink plate, it was like, wow, this could work. And, it, and it's a little rough. You can see where those lines aren't there and they're not blending perfectly. But it was, it was really an exciting moment. And I, and I thought, this, this, could, this could really lead to something. I could play with this. So then I decided, you know, I really, I need, I need to get better at this drawing thing. And I was, I've always been very influenced both typographically and with images and visually by older books. And I really, really loved old botanicals and herbals. This is an image from uh, John Gerard's herbal printed in 1633, which was the height of a scientific text at the time of identifying plants and what their properties were and um, huge big book and these are woodcuts so single color cut from wood same process as linoleum only wood instead of linoleum so I used to you know pour over these and look at these and think we'll, we'll try and try and figure out how to do it maybe I could do something like that or I would do very simplified versions of them and so I started trying to do that sort of thing on this, like the, the garlic, bunch of garlic here, which again was, I was starting to draw from life because that's what I wanted to see on the menus. I couldn't, you know, find something directly to sort of emulate or copy, so I was trying to use the style but trying to do that. And like this, you can see the direct influence of those herbal woodcuts. But I, was, I wanted also to add color to them, so then I would do the line work in black and then cut a block and add the screen to get a tint. The purple in that turnip is a little handwork that was put on with watercolor. The other, the other source of imagery that I really, really loved were, is, uh, were Japanese woodblock prints and that whole tradition. Um, this print, was made by uh, Utamaro in a book called Song of the Garden. It combined his images with the text of Japanese poets, very popular book at the time. And um, it was printed in 1788. And I loved the composition of these. They're so lyrical and beautiful, where, and the combination of the text with the image and the space in there. And I was also looking at like these leaves which had the line and the color and so graceful and trying to think how, how can I sort of incorporate that too. So I started emulating that. And here's an image made about that time. It was, this was actually a card that folded in the middle. So it had a front and a back, but um, really conceived of as one image in that Japanese woodblock style. Here's another. Very simple, but for me, kind of um, markers at the time because I was breaking these into different colors and being able to put them together and without, the, with, without necessarily the black line, but composing the image of these separate blocks just with color. And then using the space, like the beautiful space is in those Japanese prints. And this is not anything literal about the menu. This is flowering quince. But again, it's about the season, about just a moment. Here's where we are right now. Another homage to Japan with, the, with a fade at the top. Um, one of the things that has always been very interesting in the studio and satisfying is to keep pushing the limits of the medium 
and keep pushing the limits of the press itself. What, what can I do on this particular machine with these particular materials? And to, how one discovery leads to another and the impetus to try something new. So I've been making some of these special menus for the downstairs restaurant and um, Alice really wanted to have something every night in there, uh, which was very difficult to accomplish, especially with a changing menu every night. So, and then it was always right until the last hour, really, that that menu was getting determined. So I worked out a system where using an 8.5 by 11 sheet, I could print on one half of it, and then they could set the menu for the um, for the evening's dinner, you know, on the computer, output that, and then put these in the copy machine and photocopy that onto the interior and then fold it, and then there would be this combination of up-to-date menu, but something pretty and printed. So I started making these as seasonal imagery and printed them for about a year and a half or so, you know, like two or 3,000 at, at a go. Um, but which was just not sustainable at all. So eventually, um, I designed something that could be printed offset and they could print multiple thousands and that would do for a while. Nowadays, they, they still use that same system. They reproduce um, images from illustrations I made for some of the cookbooks of fruit and vel vegetable illustrations. So about the time um, about the time this menu was made, um, I was working on a book called Shape and East Vegetables where I really, this is where the sort of drawing really had to get better. And um, my task was to very specifically draw certain vegetables, 50 different ones made prints of these. And so I really started drawing from life, going to the garden or bringing material into, the, into my studio. And um, I, I didn't have, to, that was so consuming, I couldn't really spend too much time making the menu. So some of the images I made for that, I incorporated and just said, all right, I can do a menu if, you, if it's got this on it. Um, but these are images that were made for that book, actually. But I found that just by doing it, more and doing it more and doing it more, I did get better at it. Here's, here's another example of that s s split fountain, so-called technique of the multiple colors in one pass on the ink plate with the leaves of this image. These, are, um, these two were for then First Lady Hillary Clinton and uh, trying not to be intimidated by the first lady, I went you know, just the absolute opposite way and made something very, very simple. The one on the left was um, uh, a lunch, and they were trying to serve as, as many, um, gather as many ingredients as they could from the edible schoolyard in uh, Berkeley to impress upon the first lady that the beautiful food that could come from these uh, school garden pro projects. This is a New Year's Eve menu. Those are always celebrated in a, some kind of gala way at the restaurant, and extra effort was put into those menus. The, the, the menus for that event and, and others too, um, they're really souvenirs, and people take them home, and it's, it's, a, it's a way to remember something as fleeting as you know, a wonderful dinner. It's, quite a reminder in the, the experience of being there at the restaurant. Here's some more Japanese influence of space and text and image combination. These are white dogwoods. Carrie, Carrie Glenn um, was the florist at the restaurant for decades, and she was a very, very, very extraordinary woman. Uh, she, she, made these amazing floral arrangements, and this was her goodbye party. 
dinner with Mikhail Baryshnikov. Here, here again is that use of that multiple color technique. And this time, instead of one block, it's three blocks. So you can, it, 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 then, then it becomes even more interesting where you can put them right next to each other. And you'll see in some areas where the leaves overlap, there's a, there's a little line. Well, that's the double ink of that, that instead of cutting a line like a drawn line, it's just where they overprint, they, they make their own line and it helps to separate one leaf from another. It's kind of just a nice way of subtly doing that. This was a dinner for His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, um, who visited uh, the Bay Area. And he's, he's very uh, involved in, in Britain in the organic food movement there and schools and school gardens and um, organic farming in general in, in England is pretty great. And so when he came to the United States to visit, he wanted to come to the Bay Area because there's such a great movement here. And he wanted to visit the Edible Schoolyard, which they did. It's very exciting. And then there was this big dinner for both of them. This is direct influence from Japanese bird and flower prints. Um, this was made for uh, the wedding of a very close friend. He and his partner were married uh, just before uh, Proposition 8 passed on the ballot. So they were legally married in California. Uh, and the two birds on the, on the branch, they're, they're red-winged blackbirds. And the um, blackbirds, the, only the males have the color on their wings. The, the females, um, you know, are just all one color. So on this branch are two male birds. And here's another wedding. This, this one has uh, uh, quite a bit of little detail with rosemary flowers. And um, that, this is a combination of printing. And then I went in and filled in the color and the little tiny detail of those flowers uh, by hand. So this, it's really quite enjoyable to do that kind of handwork, actually. And it's, you can do things that are otherwise too subtle to do on the press. Another wedding menu that Shea Penny's did on um, a dinner on, on an island. The wedding was on the beach. So um, I wanted somehow to get sand on the, on the menu itself. And uh, through some trial and error, I figured out that if I put some vermiculite in a little cuisine art and broke it up and then Put that on the wet ink when it came out of the press. It would stick to the ink, and it and it actually made um, something that looks very much like sand. And that is the summary. So, thank you. I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have any. Talk about that. What was the main influence of your choice of that particular press and uh, mechanism? Was it its availability, or did you seek it out? Well, um, that's actually the, the, the press I first learned to print on when I was in um, David Goins's shop. Um, someone, he, he prints on an offset press, uh, but someone had given him this press. And I was one of a couple of students of his. And so an older friend of his, a uh, journeyman printer, came and taught us how to operate this press and how to print. And I just fell in love with it. Um, and I've, I've operated a few other presses, but I, I really love that one. And it's, um, I love the size of it and the simplicity of it. Th these presses are like you know, vintage cars where you can open the hood and you can still see how the whole thing works. You know, it's, sort of the opposite of a computer. Um, but it has, it's, it, it has a very graceful, wonderful mechanism that um, kind of fits the body. It's not, it's not a huge, big thing, but it, it's, 
good and solid and very capable. And um, so I, uh, I have, when, I, when I decided I wanted a press, I started looking around and I found one at um, a used equipment, printing equipment place, and there was that same press. I thought, that's for me. Have you ever had any typos? Oh. <laughs> I, I can't even count how many typos. Yeah, <laughs> Happens all the time. So when you do, is it just like, oh, well, or do you have to redo everything? Well, if you catch it in time, you can change it. But after, after it's printed, it's, oh, well. But um, I, I always try and, uh, you know, employ the services of, of a friend who's a good proofreader. I mean, you have to have somebody else look at it. You just, because when you're setting, when, once, the, once you start printing or once you set it, you sort of stop seeing it as information. You see it as shape and, you know, where it is on the page. And you, you proofreaders are a special, special group of people to be able to catch that. But yeah, I, and I'm really prone to typos. So something I have to watch out for. Um, for your menus that aren't for special events, what's the lifetime of a menu? Like, how many times can you repeat that? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the point. What's the lifetime of a menu? So how many times can you give it to, like, a new customer before it gets bad or, you know, Oh, torn? it's just, it's, it's oh, you once. you just use it once? Once. Okay. You just, they just use them once. Do they get to take it home? Yes, absolutely. Oh, they get to take okay. them home. So that's what I mean. It's, um, the restaurant doesn't advertise. They've never advertised. Yeah. They've never done anything like that. And... From very early on, um, Alice knew about good printing, knew about fine printing, and she always loved that. So that's something she wanted as part of the restaurant. So like in the very early days, um, she would get uh, local printers. And there were, the Bay Area, there's always been a, a real printing community in the Bay Area. A lot of letterpress printers, there still are. Um, she would get these printers to make a special menu or you know, a, w a week of menus or something like that, very cleverly, in exchange for food and wine. So, so they were so ready to do this. And, and then, you know, there were always these printers hanging around, late night dinners, a little table of printers, you know, drinking and drinking. But, um, so it just became really a part of the signature, the look and the style and the, um, the aesthetic of the restaurant. But the ones that they use now, um, they have a, just kind of an inventory of maybe 20 images in that 8.5 by 11 sheet. So then they can select for that night what seems appropriate for that menu or the season or that time of year. And then it's, they print out one for every diner. And, and Sorry, follow up. What percentage yeah. of people do you think bring home the menus as opposed to leaving them there? Um, I'd say, you know, on a nightly basis, you know, maybe half. Uh, the special menus, you know, the hand-printed menus, they, people, people catch on to that and they take them home. One of the things about letterpress, um, if you're familiar with it, if you're not, um, is that it has this very tactile, handmade quality. You may not know anything about the process or you may not, you know, be familiar with letterpress really, but when you hold it, you know something has happened. You know, this is, it's handmade and you, you can tell, and it communicates something. Um, it's, and, it's, and it's intimate, it's personal. Um, it's one of the things I love about the medium is it, it's called letterpress because it punches uh, the, 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 the impression into the paper. So it has a kind of textural, sculptural aspect. There are shadows where the letter forms are, and it's, it's quite beautiful. I brought some for you guys to see afterwards. Thank you. So uh, on the multi-block projects, how do you keep the registration correct? Yeah, it's tricky. Um, I work very, very methodically. I mean, printing is a, is a methodical process. It's not spontaneous. You, you, know, you have a plan, and you work step by step. And um, so you have methods of working. Uh, but I start with that drawing that you saw. And when I put it on the block and I trace over the drawing that part, of the drawing for that part of the image, um, I, I'm, I'm very faithful to that line. And so then 
the line is on the block. And then when I'm cutting, again, I am very faithful to that line. That is the real line, not, not near it, not next to it, it's the line. And, and then if you get everything sort of on the blocks in the right place, then you have the potential for registering it on the press. Then it's a matter of um, printing in a, in a likewise methodical way. But it's, it's just being very careful at every stage. And you know, my, there are lots of ways to go about this. I mean, uh, many kinds of printing, it's not so, such a tight registration. It's looser and colors overlap, and it's a little more um, you know, impressionistic looking. Um, but my particular style, my particular aesthetic is for really um, close registration. I always kind of go back to um, early botanicals and how beautiful they are. And those often were um, engraved or etched or printed in one color and hand colored. Um, a lot of the really ones you might be familiar with. But I'm trying to do that on the press. I'm trying to kind of figure out a way. So it's, it's really just working very carefully. Do you have a favorite menu or a favorite story from the menus in your book? Um, it'd be hard to pick, be hard to pick one. Um, the one. The one I showed you with the leaves where, I, where the little light bulb went off about the multicolors, that one is a favorite for me because it, it, it opened my mind about what I could do on my press. And I, um, I think there's a principle at work there which is um, partly comes from learning about cooking at Chez Panisse because when the restaurant first started, we really didn't know what we were doing. Um, there was a desire to, to, to achieve something and cook you know, fabulous food, but most of us were not trained. Um, and so Alice would make up these menus and put dishes on the menus that we had never cooked before. And there, there was you know, one, one chef who came to work and stayed for a long time, Jean-Pierre Moulet, and he, um, he was classically trained, and he was French, and he could like bring some hardcore information and technique into the kitchen. But we, we would just put things on the menu and, and then try it. And one thing we figured out right away, and you, because it's one menu one night, you're not duplicating the same thing over and over again. You know, you're always, there's always, um, the next night and new things. But is, um, if, if it didn't work, if we were unsatisfied with that dish, the thing is you just like, let's put some version of that on the menu next week. And we would do it again, and we would do it again until we got it. And then we had that technique, or we had that, that dish in the repertoire. Same thing with, with something that worked fabulously well. We would do it again soon. Um, so that we wouldn't forget. Um, because when you're cooking that, uh, when, when things are changing so often, uh, it's hard to remember. You know, you're just m moving all the time. But I, so that same way of, um, same, that same approach I took into this print studio when I stopped um, working in the kitchen, which is, you know, tr go for what you want to see I would try it, and sometimes it would work, and sometimes it wasn't. But then I would, all right, try it again, try it again. And, and eventually, you know, you kind of get there. Um, so for me, the, some of the memorable um, menus are the ones where oh, I, really, I really discovered something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks for coming. I love your work. Um, Thank you. I have a mimeograph machine, but I'm terrible at using it. <laughs> but um, I, I had a series of realizations like, oh, it matters what ink you use. I'm like, oh, it matters what paper you use. But um, I missed the beginning of your talk, but I was curious, like, how far down the rabbit hole do you go with the particular paper? Uh, I know people who, like, they're not happy with what's available, so they try to make their own. And yeah. I was just curious, like, do you enjoy that part of it, and how far do you go to get it just to your specifications? Oh, that's like, a good question. Um, very, very far down the rabbit hole, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, one, an another... You know, tremendous pleasure in printing, and I think it's one of the things that really hooks people, especially letterpress printers, is paper. A paper is just beautiful, beautiful stuff. Um, quality papers, 
and they all print differently. They all feel different. You know, they have slightly different textures and colors. So you you have to make adjustments for all of that. And um, you know, when I would be conceiving of a menu, making a plan, part of that is you know what paper, what color is the paper, what what what's it going to do in the press, and and because. Um, not all papers are suitable for block printing or letterpress printing. That kind of limits certain things. But fortunately, you know, most fine papers are really, really good. Um, I, I don't make paper, but, um, you know, we've done all kinds of things like uh, print, print some, uh, you know, an image and then make a fan out of it, cut it and glue it to sticks and, you know, in order to get a printed fan and you, know, you, you just, there are all kinds of things possible, but um, you, you build up your, your knowledge of materials and inks and um, mixing colors and what happens when you put, you know, one color on top of another and what are you likely to get and all of that. and. Um, it's, it, 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 it's, it's like all art making. I mean, it's trial and error. Basically, no rules. You know, you just keep, you do it until you get what you want. Yeah, yeah. But that's the fun of it. That's what I was saying, that discovery is, um, you, start, you start in one place and you just keep adding to that and then you get into all kinds of new places. Yeah. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you All very right. much. Can we give one more round of applause for Patricia? Thank you.